<clears throat> Hello, and thank you all for joining us. I'm AADR President Mark Hertzberg of the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and I will be moderator for today's webinar. So the AADR has hosted a series of webinars on topics related to COVID-19. Visit the IADR.org slash COVID-19 webinar series for more information and to view past webinars. So these are available and you can view them again if you loved it the first time, you will love it more the second time. Past webinars include the AADR COVID-19 uh, WebEx with NIDCR for research deans um, and uh, NIDR leadership, NIDCR leadership. COVID-19 and oral health impacts on care and early insights to pathogenesis presented by Jennifer Webster Syriac of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. COVID-19 research questions and our, and our practice from the Wuhan experience presented by Zhuan Bian from Wuhan University in China and the scientific basis for delivering oral health care during COVID-19 presented by Yang Fang Ren, the University of Rochester in New York. If you would like to receive continuing education credit for today's webinar, you will need to attend the full duration of the webinar. At the conclusion, complete the required survey, and then you will receive the attendance verification code. If you have any technical difficulties while viewing this webinar, you can use the WebEx chat window and message IADR Global Headquarters. To access the chat window, hover over the bottom of the video window and press the speech bubble icon. If you are unable to access the chat window within WebEx, go to IADR.org Use the pop-up chat window in the bottom right corner. Note that you note that you need assistance with today's webinar, and IADR staff will be able to direct your question and assist you. The WebEx chat window is also how we encourage you to ask questions for the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Ensure that all panelists is selected in the drop-down box in the drop down. You're able to submit questions at any point in the presentation, but they will not be addressed until the end of the presentations during the last portion of the webinar. In April, the AADR published the COVID-19 Rapid Response Research Agenda, which was published in the Journal of Dental Research Clinical and Translational Research Journal and the subject of the discussion with the research deans and the NIDR leadership. High priority research questions in eight topical areas were identified, as you see here. We now ask, how have we responded as a research community? How has the pandemic affected our dental research landscape. So today's topic is dental, oral, and cranial facial research in the COVID era. The speakers for this webinar are Greg H. Gilbert, who is Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Clinical and Community Sciences at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Dentistry. Gilbert also serves as National Network Director for the National Dental Practice-Based Research Network. Stuart A. Gansky is a professor and Lee Heisen Chair of Oral Epidemiology in the Division of Oral Epidemiology and Dental Public Health, as well as Associate Dean for Research of the School of Dentistry at the University of California, San Francisco. Gansky directs the University of California San Francisco 
sent it to address disparities in children's oral health, known as can do. And he directs the NIDCR funded coordinating center to help eliminate and reduce oral health in inequalities in children. Vesa Kartanen is a professor and associate dean for research and director of the oral health sciences PhD program at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And Shannon M. Wallet is the associate dean for research in the Adams School of Dentistry an interim chair and professor in the Division of Oral and Cranial Facial Health Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you for all joining me today. And our first speaker will be Dr. Gilbert. Just this. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I will briefly discuss the National Dental Practice Based Research Network or the National Dental PBN and its plans for conducting COVID-19 study. Uh, the background is that uh, the National Dental PBN has been in operation since 2005. We've demonstrated that it's possible to successfully engage everyday clinical practitioners in a very broad range of research studies. We've done a total of 38 studies so far, which have led to a total of 169 publications in peer-reviewed journal articles. And as a measure of the breadth of the topic of these studies, we've published their results in a total of 56 uh, journal titles. We are indeed a national network we comprise six regions with the locations of the regional administrative sites shown on this slide. Uh, we also have a specialty node administered at the University of Illinois at Chicago, the National Administrative and Resource Center is at UAB, and our National Coordinating Center is at Kaiser Permanente. This slide shows the geographic There we go. Okay. This slide shows the geographic distribution of patients who participated in some of our recent network clinical studies. We ask all patient participants to report their zip code of residence. So this allows us to plot their geographic location, which as we see in this slide covers a large geographic area. Now we seek to achieve a very broad range of uh, diversity of of patients, practices, and practitioners in all, all of our studies. Uh, this not only has to do with geographic diversity shown on the previous slide, and not only with regard to racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of patients and practitioners, but also with regard to practice types, such as private practice, large group practice, public health settings, some academic settings, et cetera. So our long range vision for the profession at large is that all dentists incorporate research and continuous quality improvement into their everyday clinical practice, just because that's what we do as a profession. And I would say that practitioners, at least in the network, have already achieved that vision and they invite the rest of the profession to do the same. Part of the uh, key value of the network lies in recognizing where on the continuum of research context the network lies. And this slide shows that continuum. At one end, we have laboratory research, animal studies, tissue culture studies, bench or benchtop science type studies. Then we have clinical research done in academic settings, then the PBRN setting, and then community-based settings. And another way of thinking about these settings is that a bench top setting is appropriate when you have an intervention that's not ready for humans, the academic setting when it's not ready for patients, the PBRN setting when it's not ready for practices, and the community setting when it's not ready for communities. I would say that the key take home message from this slide is that each of these settings has major strengths and each one also has significant limitations. 
So what that means is that to advance a research agenda overall, it often means that you ultimately need to engage all of these contexts. We currently have five COVID-19 studies funded in the National Dental Pre brand. All of these were investigated, initiated applications submitted for a June 1 deadline, and all were funded via, via the X01 resource access program mechanism, which frankly, until about a year or so ago, I had never heard of, so you may want to look that up. It's on the NIH webpage. And uh, details about each of these five studies are publicly available at our uh, National Dental Premium website. It is linked. I'll, so all I'm going to do is mention the titles and the location of the study PI. The first one is uh, quantifying aerosol generation in dental settings. This is a uh, study PI is at Washington University at St. Louis. We have evaluating and improving personal protective equipment use in dental settings. That's also uh, based out of the uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, particle topography and aerosol size distribution in dental settings out of the University of Toledo, Ohio. National Dental Preband COVID-19 Research Registry, also called the Core Registry. The PI is based at the Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Research. And assessing an innovative M-Dentistry e-hygiene strategy amid the COVID-19 pandemic based out of the University of Rochester. So I want to uh, point out that there is an upcoming application due date. Uh, so the five that were funded were funded as a result of this notice of special interest or, or NOCI. Uh, here's their specific uh, notice. And there are also FAQs for this NOCI at this link here. So there is an application due date of November the 2nd. So I encourage you to investigate this mechanism, this NOCI, and consider applying for that date. So thank you for your interest. And I'll pass the baton back. Very good, thank you, Greg. And so our next speaker um, as we get as we get set up here um, is Stuart Gansky from the University of California, San Francisco. Stuart. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here virtually this afternoon. See if I can advance the slides. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about our coordinating center to help eliminate or reduce oral health inequities in children. Um, this work is supported by NIDCR through a parent U01 award and through a supplement which we were um, we are thrilled to receive uh, to support a clinical trial which was separately funded by the University of California Office of the President California Breast Cancer Research Program. And I'll be talking mostly about uh, those latter two, the supplement and the uh, trial that it supports. Um, but the coordinating center, the original coordinating center supports four NIDCR trials. Uh, these are UH3 trials that um, from the UH phase of to full on large community based prevention trials for caries in children. Um, uh, I just have listed their acronyms. If you're interested, you can look those up on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I smile at BU, co op at UIC, PACT at CASE, and Beacon at UC San Francisco and LA. The um, trial uh, that the coordinating center has received a supplement to support. Uh, the trial also is registered in clinicaltrials.gov with that number there. Um, it, it is um, a pilot. It is the antiseptic mouthwash gargling solutions and pre-procedural rinse on SARS-CoV-2 
load or ample pilot trial. Um, it is, as I said, supported by uh, UC Office of the President emergency COVID-19 seed funding through the breast cancer research program. Um, the investigators are Dr. Banava, uh, Dr. My, uh, uh, Yvonne Capilla and myself. Um, and then the supplement from NIDCR is a supplement to our coordinating center to support that separately funded trial. Um, the schematic for the trial is, uh, it is a pilot, but we're using four different over-the-counter mouth rock rinses, um, distilled water, hydrogen peroxide, um, acetylpyridamine chloride, and chlorine dioxide. Um, they are applied at uh, baseline. The, the participants who test positive for COVID uh, will use them at baseline. Um, and then another follow up of a sampling at seven days and 28 days, and they will use the mouth rinse products um, throughout the 28 day or one month period. Um, these, this is a, a short description of the, um, the kinds of sampling that are going to be done for SARS CoV 2 um, saliva collection, uh, as well as one time um, or a pharyngeal swab. And uh, those will be collected. Um, so, with our, the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus more on what the coordinating center is doing to support the trial because that's what the NIDCR supplement is for. Um, we are using um, NIDCR, we are using uh, REDCap to support this trial. It's a clinical trials management system. Uh, we're using permuted block randomization, which is embedded within REDCap so that um, it maintains blinding and it maintains uh, the fact that uh, 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 the investigators don't know uh, who is the next, uh, the next participant, what their assignment would be. Um, it's configured, the REDCap system is configured, um, it can provide um, study calendars, randomization schedules, and case report forms. And then um, we train the staff to use the system. Uh, there is an, it, part of the system is to just demonstrate, uh, display rather a um, REDCap instrument dashboard. And so at the bottom, you can see uh, kinds of forms that are displayed. Uh, consenting will actually be electronic consenting through the REDCap electronic consenting facility. And in addition, as I'll talk about a little bit, there's um, daily uh, text messaging of questionnaire to participants about their adherence and uh, to the mouthwash assigned. Um, I thought that it might be useful for um, some of the, the attendees today to know a little bit more about um, some of the resources that are available if you're going to be doing COVID-19 research, clinical research. Um, and so there are some standardized data collection instruments. Uh, this includes uh, Phoenix, uh, one that's called Disaster Response Research 2 or DR2. Um, these two are affiliated with NIH. Um, and then uh, there's another that's called CDISC, which is particular to clinical trials um, and fits within the uh, clinical trials data model. And, um, and REDCap does have a capacity for um, downloading um, already entered instruments, which can help um, speed research along and, and uh, eliminate errors. So there is a, a library um, you can import the forms for specific items from a form directly from the library into your uh, clinical trials management system project and for, to, in order to utilize that. Um, there are two um, kinds of case report forms that are in the REDCap library that relate to COVID research. One of them is from the All of Us Research Program, and it includes um, quite a number of behavioral and uh, uh, attitudinal types of measures. Um, it's called the COPE survey, and here's just a, a quick uh, display of one of the items there on symptoms. And another one is the CDC, um, the CDC instrument, which is mostly used to report um, data that is. Sorry, it's not advancing again. Uh, 
here we go, uh, mostly used to report uh, testing data, but it also does have, for example, um, part of an instrument about pre existing conditions to look at um, people uh, who might be more susceptible. Um, so, as I mentioned, so those are the, the common data elements that we can bring in to REDCap and that we're utilizing in this clinical trial. Um, and then the other facility is to send text messaging. And this is really important um, in the COVID world and in the remote research world because we can send questionnaires to participants through text messaging. They can click on a link and then it will open up on their smartphone um, and they can complete it that way. So it's a red cap interface with a product called Twilio. Okay, so um, in addition, um, there's there's um, regular monitoring of the AMPLE trial uh, with video conferences with the trial team and the su support staff from the coordinating center and um, periodic reports to, to the team uh, on a variety of issues, including adverse events uh, and uh, lots of quality assurance and quality control being performed by the coordinating center staff. Um, the final thing that I wanted to talk about is, um, is this uh, task force. UCSF has a COVID-19 research coordination task force. Um, this is in the early stages of being formed. Um, and it's basically to try to control um, how participants are asked to participate in COVID research so that we're not overburdening people and having people who test positive or even are going for testing get, um, you know, 10 different invitations to participate in research. And in addition, UCSF has just started this, um, been funded to start this um, uh, PCAB, this uh, PCORI funded uh, patient and community advisory board that is specifically focused on COVID research and asking opinions of people in the community about, um, you know, how they want, to, what kinds of research do they want to participate in and how do they want to be approached and how do they want to participate in it? Um, do they, you know, want, do they feel comfortable coming into uh, clinics and coming into our institutions or are they only willing to participate uh, from in a distance setting? And this particular one is reaching out in particular to the communities at highest risk, like African Americans, Latinos, um, American Indians, and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Um, and so recommendations, finally, recommendations that I would have for people who, uh, researchers, dental researchers who want to do clinical research with in COVID or with people who are COVID positive is um, I would recommend that you check and then continue to check um, your applicable rules and policies uh, at your institution and in your, your geographic location uh, because those things do change um, over time. And um, just as soon as you have approval for a particular way to conduct research, it may change. So you need to keep up with that. Um, and again, check with your IRB in terms of their policy changes. And then finally, I would suggest interacting with the community um, because it would be really difficult to recruit participants if it's for a kind of research that the community doesn't feel comfortable. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Stuart. Our next speaker is Lisa Kartanen from the University of Michigan, who will give us a look inside the activities at his institution. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, so uh, I thought that I will uh, present uh, update what's uh, going on here at School of Michigan, Dental School at uh, University of Michigan, and let's see if the slides will advance. So I thought that I will present two uh, uh, things. Uh, think, discuss about what is the impact of COVID-19 on research in dental schools, uh, schools like ours, and how uh, the research conducting in dental schools uh, can help to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And um, uh, first, uh, I will tell a bit about uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, uh, here at the U of M uh, uh, School of Dentistry. Um, this situation is pretty similar probably as what you have experienced in, in many other schools uh, throughout the country. In our case, uh, we ramped down our research activities on March 20th. This all happened in five days when we went from full speed to stand still. Uh, uh, the research re-engagement planning started in May and the uh, wet lab uh, research re-engagement uh, started on June 8th. Um, uh, we have four waves. Uh, uh, this was very controlled, gradual process. Uh, we uh, obtained guidance uh, and quite uh, clear guidance from the state of Michigan and as well as uh, from University of Michigan Office of Research. Um, uh, these uh, waves uh, were, were structured so that we had also shifts in built into them. And in the first shift, uh, we could have only 30% of the maximum COVID occupancy rate, which was 140 square feet per person. Now the uh, shift structure is a little bit more relaxed and we can have at the moment 45% of the COVID maximum rate. So we are still having a very sparsely populated labs in our research enterprise. The human subject research uh, uh, was uh, uh, re-engaging in four different tiers. Um, tier Zero was uh, studies which were never really stopped because the value of them was so high for, for participants. Uh, most of the School of Dentistry studies are in tiers two and three. And uh, tier three studies are still paused. We are still waiting that the state would advance to the next phase and uh, it would require that the COVID uh, uh, situation would uh, uh, improve uh, quite a bit in our state. There's no question this has resulted in loss of productivity. Uh, University of Michigan Office of Research uh, conducted a little survey where they um, obtained data from 21 peer institutions, so research intensive universities. Some of those were uh, Ivy League schools, some of them were Big Ten schools, some of them were in UC system. And turned out that the situation in every sim single school is quite similar. So there was a big uh, worry among our scientists at the school, University of Michigan that uh, that um, others, other people would get like a competitive edge. That uh, didn't seem to be the case. There are actually many schools where they have even more strict uh, conditions in research engagement uh, as what we have currently. Um, so uh, then, so what can we do? Uh, and specifically, how can research in dental schools contribute to understanding on the pathogenesis of viral uh, of, the, of this viral uh, uh, epidemic pandemic? How can we uh, research in dental school improve diagnostics? And how can research in dental schools facilitate safe practices in dental schools and clinics? Um, during the last uh, few months, we have seen a dramatic, dramatic burst of COVID-19 research, uh, which will likely be beneficial, not just solving COVID-19 related health challenges, but also more broadly in helping treatments of other life threatening diseases. So there may be a silver lining uh, in this uh, terrible situation where we are after all. And if nothing else, this experience will make us uh, better prepared for the next pandemic, uh, which, uh, as the expert will have said, will eventually come. And while the COVID-19 pandemic has been, in all counts, a terrible challenge for the mankind, we should also recognize the fact that we are now better prepared to this type of challenge than what we have ever been before. There has been, in the last decade, uh, significant advances in multiple different domains, which will help this situation. Uh, the vaccine development has been uh, advancing fast, and this situation has forced uh, uh, investigators to uh, 
really launch more aggressively these new type of techniques, whether they are RNA vaccines or gene therapy based, uh, I don't know, viral based vaccines. Uh, it, uh, there's a lot high likelihood that these vaccines will be more versatile, allow much faster pace uh, in implementing them and uh, possibly also better outcomes. Also, uh, single cell techniques, modern sequencing technologies, other omic based technologies, omics will uh, have, made, have, have made us much better prepared to study uh, pathogenetic mechanisms of uh, viral diseases such as COVID-19. And also uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, based techniques combined with microfluidics have uh, allowed uh, investigators to develop really powerful techniques for uh, detection of viral, viral diseases. These are just waiting for approval, but there are technologies which are really exciting, like Carmen, which allows us analysis of almost 5,000 samples on a single chip in a very short period of time. Also, there are technologies uh, uh, combining engineering approaches and artificial intelligence, which will which have allowed more reliable pred predictions of viral spread uh, and so on. And one application of this in, is in our school, uh, where uh, uh, studies uh, in collaboration with our school, spearheaded by Dr. Ramesh Nalaya, and uh, in, together with investigators in the College of, of, College of Engineering, have used the high-speed, high-resolution photography together with the artificial intelligence to model aerosol uh, dynamics in dental clinics. And these studies uh, we have already now taught us how to create more safer environment in dental clinics. They have told us some more about how the divider should be placed so that it's, uh, it's uh, scientifically data-based and safer environment, how to optimize airflow, and so on and so on. Uh, we have other studies uh, ongoing in our school. One of those is spearheaded by Dr. Robert uh, uh, Eber. Uh, his group is studying uh, the point of care assessment of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, antibody and the antigen responses in healthcare settings, mostly using healthcare workers in, or in, in healthcare workers. Uh, we have investigators studying host responses to vaccine adjuvants for emergence in pathogens. We have uh, investigators studying how uh, inflammatory cell burden can affect the recovery of COVID-19. And we have also then investigators studying how COVID-19 has changed the stress levels among dental professionals. I will stop here and hand it back to Mark. Thank you very much, Visa. And now for the view from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, we have Shannon Wallet. Hello, Mark and everybody else today. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to sort of share what we're doing over here in North Carolina. Um, my the focus of what I really wanted to share with everybody today was um, some of the collaborative research that's been going on and, and why we feel that that nature of that collaboration is so important, um, specifically during this time um, sort of, of, of crisis. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about are just examples of, the, of everything that's going on. Um, we have a lot going on and I didn't um, don't want it to by any means to be um, exclusionary from some of the other wonderful activities that are occurring, um, but really just to highlight um, some of the collaborations that we have sort of going on across campus. First of all, it's awesome to see so many people on this webinar, some friends and family from near and far. So it's good to virtually see you. Um, so thank you for attending. Um, so um, I wanted to start a little bit about what North Carolina looks like. I know all of our areas that we're talking about are a little different um, in the demographics across the United States. And so this first slide is really just about uh, the number of cases in each of our counties across uh, the state. Um, and it's really to highlight the reason why team science is so imperative. We have many thousands of cases across the state, but as you can see, the types of cases and the numbers of cases 
is really geographically different depending on where you're located. Similarly, if we were to look at the same type of uh, graph, but now looking at the number of deaths by county, again, you can see that it is very diverse depending on where you are in the state. Um, but our numbers are high, as you know, many of us can't travel outside of the state to some of your states to come and visit um, and vice versa. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so this just sort of highlights what one of the major needs that I think um, is out there is to sort of figure out how we can work together um, to curb what's occurring. So for those of you that don't know where UNC Chapel Hill is, we are right here. Um, so we physically have in our county 1,356 um, cases with 48 of those um, resulting in death. But you'll notice we're surrounded by an awful lot of dark colors. Um, and so our geographic area really has been hit very hard uh, by this pandemic. So our school in general had three major phases to how uh, we responded, uh, much like was described in the previous talk. We did have a ramp down procedure where um, everything except emergency clinical practice stopped. Um, we did not stop treating patients here at the Adams School of Dentistry, um, but we did limit that practice for both PPE purposes, um, as well as health and safety of our patients, as well as our caregivers. Um, the first thing to come back though at the Adams School of Dentistry and at UNC Chapel Hill in general really was the research reentry. Uh, we were um, much like the previous uh, speaker uh, dictated uh, that reentry by what our systems office uh, requested. Um, we went to a 50% capacity pretty quickly. Um, we are now probably at about a 75% capacity across campus and that includes the Adams School of Dentistry. During that same time, there was also a clinical practice ramp up, um, not a reentry because it really just expanded the clinical practice that was being given. And then the last set um, to return to campus was our educational reentry. And that actually just started on August 3rd um, with a combined sort of um, in class as well as virtual learning. As you can imagine for dental schools as well as many healthcare uh, 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 schools, being on campus and being in person um, is part of the educational process. Um, and so we have really balanced the need for that educational um, experience with um, the needs of PPE, but also um, safe social distancing practices. Um, and so we've all been very hard at work and making all three of these things all happen at the same time. And so what I'm really gonna talk about is what uh, we've done uh, in the research arena. So the state realized quickly that it needed to act quickly. And so um, we have a North Carolina policy collaboratory here at UNC. And what it has um, uh, adopted is to supporting some of the COVID-19 research projects. Um, and this is to actually inform our lawmakers and our policymakers to help guide the state's response. And so in May, they appropriated about $29 million to the NC collaboratory to support this research. Um, and then UNC's Vice Chancellor for Research's office formed an ad hoc committee to look at the projects that were put forth um, to uh, the Vice Chancellors for Research and the Adams School of Dentistry um, was a part of that decision making process. It ended up that the Vice Chancellor for Research's office was allocated about $15 million. Um, and the reason for this was because UNC is actually currently the largest coronavirus research portfolio. If you look at the total dollar amount that has been given to UNC for um, coronavirus research, and we're third in the world, only behind the CDC and the NIH, um, uh, as, as far as the amount of money that's being um, provided for corona research. If you have any um, questions about the types of projects that were um, provided through the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory, the full list is provided at this website. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of them. And I'm going to talk focus mainly on those that were um, associated with the Adams School of Dentistry. So the what really the majority of the money that was given to the school was it was uh, for infrastructure. Um, and so we have a translational services center here at the Adams School of Dentistry that turned into a COVID translational services center um, through really a grassroots initiative. Um, I think this is a perfect example of how things have sort of happened around COVID research. 
Um, I'm the co-director of this uh, service center with Rob Mail, who is in the Department of Surgery here in the School of Medicine. And through some of our collaborations, um, Dr. Wolfgang, Matt Wolfgang from uh, the School of uh, Medicine, who was also in the Marsico Lung Institute, um, needed to put together an infrastructure to be able to process, collect, track, and then redistribute samples that um, were for COVID positive individuals. Um, and so we worked together along with Jennifer Webster Syriac in her lab who had a BSL two plus facility um, to provide this infrastructure to a range of investigators. And if you have any interest in what else we do, there's also another website. And so what we have done over the past, I would say, three to four months is we've actually been able to supply um, this infrastructure to a variety of investigators studying a variety of different things that have to do with COVID. But each one of these different investigators, and this is only the PI of the IRBs, to be perfectly honest, most of these are teams of investigators, um, run their samples and or their um, downstream assays through this, this recharge center which has been um, wonderful in that now we have a biorepository and, a, and an ability to um, track and share samples across studies. Um, and I think that's probably been one of our, our biggest learning curves and actually one of the biggest benefits to having this as a centralized system. And so for those of you that are you know, planning on doing multi um, or cross study evaluations, it is nice to have it sort of running through a single center or repository. Um, and it also has made it such that we can, um, you know, preserve samples and make sure those samples are being um, not du uh, duplicated or that the participants are also not being approached. And I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, I'm gonna keep talking now. All right. Maybe. So this is just one example of that. So um, Ralph Barrick, as many of you know, is um, one of the primary researchers in coronaviruses for many of the years. Um, and he's been asked to do a lot of the trials for the, vac or a lot of studies for the vaccine trials that are going on. And so what we have set up is a way for those samples to come through this uh, initiative, go through the BSL-2 processing, be put into a, a limb system such as the LDMS, we aliquot them and store them according to each and S and IBC and CDC approved protocols. And then we either send them back out to the um, downstream investigators or to the BSL-3 facilities where they can do some of the assays that are needed. And so this is just one example of how we are sort of collaborating with lots of schools across campus to have a, um, a footprint in that COVID research. In addition to this, several of our investigators here in dentistry have also um, applied for some of the supplements that you've already talked about. And so I'm just gonna briefly go over a few of those studies. I believe Jennifer has given a talk to um, uh, for the AADR webinar a few, um, a few weeks ago. And so I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this study, but she has applied for a CTSA supplement through um, the U01 mechanism to really look at how um, some of these methodologies that's being used for COVID detection and antibody detection can be done in the saliva and how you can do that in a single step. And so she has a wonderful study planned and we're really hoping that that um, uh, supplement comes through. In addition, in collaboration with Ralph Barrick um, and the School of Medicine, uh, so Ralph Barrick is actually in the School of Public Health, we have applied for U54, which is for the Serological Sciences uh, Centers for Excellence. Um, it has three major projects, um, one of which will be done in the School of, uh, of Dentistry. Um, and so again, another really good example of collaborative research um, uh, throughout uh, multiple schools here at UNC. Um, the goal of this particular application is to identify and advance uh, research opportunities that characterize the immune responses. Um, one of the things that I love about this project and one of the reasons that um, co-PI on this U54 is because they do really have a focus on the oral nasopharyngeal cavity um, and saliva as well as throat washes is a huge um, sort of focus for this application and looking at antibody responses or the serology in those uh, particular oral fluids. And so the I sort of already talked about this slide, but really the, the goal of the project that will be done in dentistry is to really look at the differences in the immune responses that occur in the or, or nasopharyngeal area, as well as the lung, 
in mild disease versus severe disease and see if there are ways that we can use those oral fluids to then detect and or predict how people will um, uh, or not develop severe disease. So, in addition to some of those studies, we have some novel um, collaborations with the Marsico Lung Institute as well. Um, so, Kevin Bird, who is a DDS PhD and new faculty in our um, division, is also exploring novel mechanisms of the pathogenesis via this oral lung axis. Um, and his inter his uh, interests, and um, this is another huge team science initiative, not just here on campus, but also with the NIH as well as industry. Um, and really looking at how the different cell types within specifically epithelial cell types within the oral nasopharyngeal um, cavity are affected uh, by SARS-2 uh, infection. And then we also have um, studies that are really aimed at trying to uh, um, figure out how to get dentists back to work um, in a safe and effective manner and also the acceptability of some of these practices as far as um, patients are concerned and practitioners in private practice. Um, and so um, much like the study that was presented a, a little bit earlier, we have uh, Dr. Jay Cox and Dr. Webster Syriac and our faculty who are really interested in the short-term effects of some of these antiseptic mouth rinses um, to determine how effective they are as a patient is in the dental chair. Um, but then also the acceptability and feasibility of incorporating these into practice, um, much like some of the discussions with the PBRN. And then finally, um, the last thing that I just wanted to point out is that, um, you know, the types of research and the types of um, initiatives that are needed uh, right now are much farther reaching than just the basic sciences, um, but also how do we respond to this pandemic as um, an industry and, and, and so under the guidance of Dr. Weinschaub, um, there has been this response to the pandemic to developing this virtual oral health helpline, um, so teledentistry. Um, and so their paper has just been accepted to JADA and I couldn't find everybody's picture who is on this paper, so I apologize, but I've listed everybody's name. Um, and as you can see, this was a huge initiative by a lot of our investigators here. Um, at UNC to make this work and they made it happen overnight um, and that's what was needed. Um, and so I think that um, there were a lot of lessons learned from that and, and I'm hoping that this, this paper will help others to be able to develop a, a similar plan um, in the hopes we don't have to have it for another pandemic, but um, in another crisis. And so I'm just going to sort of stop there. Um, uh, much to both of the Chris's chagrins, I didn't turn my uh, presentation until the very last second. Um, but part of this is just to highlight the reason that this team science is imperative. Um, so as of today at 10:42 a.m., I was supposed to have this in last night. Um, there have been, you know, 736,766 deaths in the world. And with just within the United States, we've had 162,104. And so I think it is very important that the way that we approach this is in a multidisciplinary area. And I think dentistry and uh, oral uh, research has a, a huge um, um, place at that table. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, clearly, you've set a very high bar for the rest of us. Uh, if the audience uh, would write their questions, type their questions in the chat, we can then share them with the panelists who will turn on their mics and turn on their videos so we can all see them. Uh, <clears throat> while, while we're waiting for the audience to ask questions, uh, I'd like to know from the panelists, there was there was some small mention of student participation, but I'm wondering whether there is a way for the PBRNs to engage with dental schools, dental clinics, and dental students to participate in COVID research. So, Greg, I wonder if you can comment on that. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, there, there is. Uh, we have academic clinical sites participating in the PBRN, and we do contribute for some of the regional sites to the dental curriculum. Uh, dental students participating in individual research projects, that varies, it really runs the gamut from none to quite a bit. 
Uh, I'm not aware off the top of my head of uh, students participating in these particular five studies. So just FYI for the community, our student research group with whom we met just a couple of weeks ago, we met with their leadership, is very anxious to participate in research that's not necessarily wet fingered at the bench, but work that they can manage given their, the level of clinical competence that they've achieved. So consider them a resource going forward. Uh, <clears throat> so our audience seems to be very quiet. I don't see any um, anything coming up. So I can sort of talk a little bit while people are coming up with their <laughs> questions, um, a little bit about the student research. So we've, we've really struggled with that um, here at the university because, you know, sort of the policies that have been put in place for, you know, who can come to campus and who can't come to campus has made that a little difficult, um, you know, and that's true for not just our dental student researchers, but also our undergraduate researchers. And, and so I think our final policy ended up being that as long as they followed the, the guidelines that were set forth and, you know, the research labs still were only at that 50% uh, capacity, who was in the lab was left up to the individual units, such as the associate dean for researcher or, or the division chairs or department chairs. Um, and so we've, we've also struggled with that. Um, well, very good. So uh, I, I can comment on that as well. Um, so we actually shut down pretty early. We shut down, um, I think it was, we got notice March 13th to shut down by the 16th to ramp down. Um, we then reopened, I think on like, in May and at 12 and a half percent capacity, and we've only gone to 25% capacity in labs. Um, but we all 25 of our summer research fellows of our uh, dental students between first and second years um, who were approved to do research projects were able to do research projects this summer. So some of them had to modify their projects. So if you person, it's now become chat focus group. Some people moved more to data analysis only projects, um, but all of them were able to work with their original mentors in the original sort of disciplinary areas that they were interested in to modify. Okay, very good. Um, there, there's a question about um, uh, detecting virus and saliva. Should I take that? Sure. Um, what would you see are, as, as the best strategies for detection of virus and saliva? I'm, I'm sorry, what, what, what did you say, Mark? I would, I would just edit the question a little bit and put it to the panel, including you, Stuart. What do you see as the best or mo most robust strategies for detecting virus in saliva? Uh, well, I know that there are some diagnostic tests on the market that are EUA, uh, FDA EUA approved um, that do detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in saliva. Um, there are different modalities. Some of them, the, after collection, they get shipped out to a lab. Um, and I, I don't think there are any uh, sort of rapid point of care tests yet that are salivary uh, sample based, but, um, but I know people are working on those. Yeah, and so here we're doing a, um, a very large survey of our, our population and, and we're collecting both saliva and nasopharyngeal swabs. And a lot of what we are doing is doing exactly asking that question is what is the best modality to be able to detect it in saliva and how does that compare to the nasopharyngeal swab? Um, and so, you know, I don't think Jennifer's on this particular call, but, um, you know, they are looking at antigen detection, but also um, uh, nucleic acid detection, um, as well as antibody detection, um, and, and to see how well those compare. Just based on the papers that have come out that, you know, viral shedding in the saliva is really high, um, that, you know, that we're hoping this modality will be able to turn, be able to turn into a point of care. And I think there is one academic institution who does have um, rapid might be a strong word, but a quicker test for um, for saliva, if I'm not mistaken. And I just don't know it off the top of my head. 
Okay, I'd like to get, we're getting more questions in. If in our time allotment, we can't get to them all, uh, I would encourage the panelists to respond offline, perhaps by return email. Uh, <clears throat> D'Souza asks how we can position dental public health, um, the dental public health and community health uh, research for the community. Uh, for, I'm sorry, for the future. How can we best position our assets in dental public health and community health research for the future? I guess you've stumped the panel. I was gonna say I have an opinion on everything, but I was gonna let every you know somebody else answer. But <laughs> nobody else. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I can step in as well. It's best to involve the community, uh, as I mentioned in my talk of using um, a a patient and community advisory board um, and get their feedback because. Um, some people, based on how people are enduring the current pandemic, uh, some people maybe have more time on their hands and are more interested in doing something and feeling productive. Other people are scrambling to um, to work and have their kids on uh, on Zoom learning for school and all the other things. So I think that's one thing, and I think that there's great capacity. As, um, for example, as, as Dr. Wallet had mentioned for teledentistry um, with Dr. Weintraub and colleagues paper, um, I think that there's, there's a great deal of telehealth that's happening that has happened and will continue to happen. Um, I've heard some estimates that um, maybe 60% of telehealth visits will continue on um, the kinds of telehealth visits that have happened during pandemic. Okay, Dr. Weintraub asks if there are difficulties in recruiting COVID-19 positive patients various studies. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, you, you know, we, we were worried about that. Um, and I think that that is um, actually been, you know, one of the, the learning curves that, you know, actually went not steep. Um, People are very willing and longitudinal studies. A lot of those studies that I mentioned are actually a year long and they have to commit to coming back once a month for a year. Um, and they do have a very high um, enrollment rate. Okay. Um, Dr. Acevedo asks, how does mouthwash work against COVID-19 in the mouth? So, there was, yeah, there's there's a good bit of research that's um, uh, more than a decade old that uh, that looks at antiseptic mouth rinses that are mostly in uh, East and Southeast Asia for prevention of um, of respiratory illnesses, particularly in winter time. Um, and following SARS-1 and MERS, um, there are researchers like Eggers et al. and Sakai et al. who have looked at different kinds of uh, antiseptic products, mouth rinses used for gargling and for mouth rinsing for 30 seconds and have shown that those, um, there are in vitro studies that have shown that antiseptic, some antiseptic mouth washes have virus uh, activity against uh, coronaviruses such as SARS-1 and MERS, and there are other studies that have shown a decrease in sort of illness uh, when gargling is used as a regular hygiene practice. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Danucci asks, are there any projects that may inform dental practices contemplating ma making engineering modifications to mitigate COVID transmission. Um, is, there any, is there any evidence to support pre-testing dental patients bef bef before aerosol producing procedures? And if so, is this feasible? So we, we have, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll address both of those really quickly. So at the Health Sciences Center here for pre-operative procedures before um, we were talking about dentistry, they were doing, pre-op testing. 
Um, and what they found is that one, the turnaround time for the test is not fast enough. Um, and because you really do need to do it within a very short window before coming in. And so the feasibility and cost to benefit ratio there is not high. Um, unless you can do a point of care test, which is why the point of care test is really so um, valuable. Um, as far as the engineering controls, I know our School of Public Health here is working on that. Um, we are looking to see if there are unique engineering controls that we should be looking at for dentistry. So any feedback for that would be great. And we would love to have our public health colleagues work on that. Okay, very good. Um, we are a little after uh, six o'clock Eastern time, and um, we we can go on, but the CE code will be important to a number of you, and you can see it now on your screens. You have endured and you have earned the code. Um, we would like the questionnaire uh, responded to if you can, but uh, for those of you who need CE credit, there is the code. So I assume we can take another question or two while people are writing down the code. Uh, if people in you know, different localities have to sign off, we certainly understand. So uh, Dr. Vieira uh, asks, uh, points out that inequalities on our campus became more visible during this period are there any strategies out there to look more in depth at the underlying issues that affect individuals of specific groups and integrate and channel resources to these kinds of efforts? I don't know if it's necessarily on the, the research side of things, um, but I know that on our campus, uh, people are particularly concerned about parents of young children, both um, students, graduate students, uh, staff and faculty um, who are having to cope with work doing their jobs while also um, having young children at home and um, being very active participants in their education. And so they're working at trying to, um, to come up with ways to be more supportive of that. Um, and in terms of the question of inequalities on our campuses. I, I'm wondering if that also means communities um, in which the campuses are, because I, I think that there's there's much more happening in the communities, the local communities, um, and it's really laid bare inequalities that existed before COVID, but, uh, but have become more, much more pronounced. Yeah, we had a very similar um, experience in that. Um, and, and what I, I will say is that our, our regulatory agencies have really helped us uh, move a little bit more quickly. So, so things as simple as consent forms being um, in you know, different languages um, so that we can consent individuals who happen to be affected by this a little bit more, um, uh, I would say robustly, um, but also things such as you know, the technologies that we want to use to be able to run some of these studies, people don't all have access to. And so they tend to get left out of those particular studies. Um, and so there is a huge push here to be able to keep be mindful of there are certain areas that um, may be neglected, but if your study is not designed and or I would say controlled properly. Um, so Alex, that is a, an excellent question. Um, I don't know if there's an easy answer to it, um, uh, you know, because again, you know, part of this is a speed issue. And, and as you know, at institutions such as ours, the wheels don't always move really quickly. So we've been really blessed that IRB and those types of individuals have really worked with us to, to be able to allow us to do that. I'm wondering whether Greg can comment on, uh, from the point of view of the PBRNs, are there studies in the communities that are attempting to address the existing qualities and perhaps how we can channel resources, particularly dental care and, uh, and COVID care uh, resources to them? Well, the uh, five that we had have funded are not looking at the nexus between the PBRN or the healthcare system and the community of arts. So I'd love to see some of those come in for that November 2nd deadline. Um, so what we're doing currently within the PBRN is what I mentioned with an emphasis on diversity of patients, practice types, and practitioners. 
Uh, so of these five, actually two of them are what I would call preclinical studies. The other ones are within the healthcare system, specifically PBRN. So I would love to see us uh, move to the nexus between the healthcare system and the community. And it probably would have to do with uh, uh, focusing on getting the community uh, into the healthcare system and dealing with this dental care access issue. So uh, I think that would be prime for a November 2nd deadline. Very good. I have a feeling we're, we're conducting a discussion among the panelists now because there haven't been any questions. But I, but I have a question. If one wanted to do an intervention trial and ask the question, will an oral mouth rinse mitigate the risk of transmission of COVID-19 with or without a supplementary nasal spray, how many, how many subjects would you need to enroll? Seems to me that these are huge studies. If you want so, to get yeah, so I mean, we, you know, the, the idea of the pilot is to demonstrate uh, feasibility and proof of concept um, that it does actually work and and continue to work. Um, uh, it depends on your question would depend on the underlying prevalence and transmission rates in the community in which it occurs. Um, right. There are certainly high risk populations, and um, those might include healthcare workers. Although healthcare workers seem to be, um, maybe we have learned sufficiently about how to use PPE and reduce risks for healthcare workers. There are, even though there were a great deal of healthcare workers in Europe and in the Northeast who who perished uh, while treating patients, I think. That 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 has gone down. Um, uh, so we might look at other communities that that are highest at risk, uh, in in terms of um, you know both for research efficiency and also for um, taking a potential solution to the people who need it the most. We do have what seems to be a, a last question from the audience from Dr. Silber. Uh, he asked. Uh, I assume he wants to know if there are any studies on nasal saline irrigation. Yeah, I mean, I did look at that um, you know, sort of nasal lavage or, um, but, but I didn't see any evidence for that. I know um, in clinicaltrials.gov, there are a couple of uh, registered trials. Uh, last time I checked, they hadn't yet begun, but one of them, for example, is a PVPI nasal spray, and I believe that's being conducted at Stanford. Um, and so that's uh, a possibility, but my understanding is that, uh, you know, salt water uh, rinse uh, doesn't necessarily, um, is, isn't going to be a um, effective against the virus. Okay, very good. So I, so, uh, there was a follow up comment about that question, something about the Elvis study. I'm not quite sure what that refers to. I know Elvis, Elvis is still alive, but um, I'm not sure what the Elvis study is. Um, it doesn't deal with fried peanut butter and banana sandwiches. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that Elvis study. Right. Okay, well, the suggestion is that we check it out. We look it up. Um, somebody also comments that a study will begin soon in Florida at a hospital using a clear xylitol nasal spray, which was shown to enact COVID in laboratory studies. So that's FYI. Um, so I think that I think we should wrap it up. I want to thank our panelists very, very much for participating. But even more so, I want to thank our audience for listening and for contributing very interesting questions. So please check out the AADR COVID-19 resources webpage. You'll find information on all of the new NIH and NIDCR research initiatives dedicated to COVID-19. And um, we, uh, we look forward to future webinars for our community down the road. 
So thank you all and have a good day.